So welcome everyone to the July 14th NEMSIS V3 implementation call. We appreciate you being with us this morning. Just as a reminder, these uh, calls are recorded and we offer them on our website and also on our YouTube channel for you to go back and review or to share with your team if there's a section that is missed. Uh, we do invite you to come off of mute or to use the chat feature um, as we go through the agenda. If there are topics that you need that you would like to comment on or you have feedback or input, we really encourage these meetings to be a conversation um, and for you to um, be able to um, talk about the things that that need to be addressed with this group. We've got such a, such a wide range and dynamic group with us today. We appreciate, um, we appreciate all the input. We will go ahead and move down to the agenda. Laurel Bader had a conflict this morning, so I'm gonna take her maintenance update really quick. There will be maintenance this month and there will be some associated downtime. Laurel will send out a Google group message with those specific instructions and timeframes. So watch for that to come through on the Google group forum for when, um, when that downtime will occur and what that, what that maintenance is entailing. Now we are ready for, um, we have uh, several guests with us with us today. We appreciate them being here. Um, Dr. Michael Redliner and Mike Tegman are here with us this morning. And I'm gonna go ahead and just turn it over to you gentlemen to um, share the lights and sirens um, information. Great, thank you so much. Um, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Michael Redliner. Um, I am the uh, current president of the National EMS Quality Alliance um, and um, a member of the National Association of EMS uh, Physicians. Um, I am uh, here today to talk a little bit about uh, a project that we are um, uh, working with partners from across the EMS and patient safety space. Uh, but we are we're here to talk about our uh, reducing lights and sirens national quality initiative. And um, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of the overview for a minute or two, and then I'm gonna turn it over to um, Mike Tegman, uh, who will kind of give a, a bit of a deeper dive into the details of this national project. Um, we're very, you know, I think traditionally, we've all talked about good quality measures, good data, and thinking about um, ways to improve the care that we provide to uh, our patients in EMS. Um, and uh, we're, we're not that good at implementing large scale projects. And this is an effort by these national organizations to take a stab at implementation of change to improve uh, the safety for patients. And so um, our, our project here hopefully will become a trend over time but it, this, this first project is really aimed at reducing the use of lights and sirens uh, in EMS. And the reason why we're doing it is, to, uh, is because we know that lights and sirens use is associated with increased accidents, increased uh, harm to patients and to providers. Um, I, I would say specifically to this group uh, who deal every day with the data that's associated with it, we've already come to some challenging places uh, to understand how lights and sirens is documented and captured in, uh, in the medical record and uh, in, in NEMSIS in particular. Uh, so we've already kind of started to think about some of the data challenges that are gonna be associated with this program. But what we're here to do today is to invite you to become part of the advisory group uh, so that um, we have the real experts in the room to help us address some of these problems. Um, and as we go through what we hope to kick off in 2022 uh, is really a, a national effort to reduce the use of lights and sirens to improve uh, patient safety, patient and provider safety in EMS. Uh, so um, uh, I know a, a few of you folks around here, I know Maximo Sierra's on from uh, New York City, who's a colleague of mine. I'm happy to see that he's on. And uh, 
Um, so I'm, but I, what I'm, I think what we're looking for is really some folks who are interested in, in joining uh, to give us some advice about how we can do this in the best way and really look to improve patient care. So uh, Mike, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a little more about the details. Thanks for having us and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group. Sounds good. Good morning, everybody. It is uh, it is fun to see um, friends in the in the list here, um, particularly uh, uh, Brenda Staffan, who I haven't run across in a long time. It's exciting to to see you here. Um, wanted to just spend just a minute to kind of give you the super high level overview of this uh, this work and this project. Um, we are uh, stealing a framework uh, for large scale change. Uh, from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. They call it their breakthrough collaborative model. And uh, basically the, the process is you start by uh, selecting a topic where there's already evidence in the world that improvement has been made. So we're not developing the improvements from scratch. We're, uh, we're basically bringing together um, folks that have actually already, already done the work um, and recruiting um, experts in the field, uh, folks like Doug Koopas, um, Jeff Jarvis, uh, folks, many of you, uh, you know, who are kind of topic experts, um, along with uh, folks like uh, Dr. Brian Wilson and the folks from uh, Niagara um, that have uh, used kind of rigorous methodology uh, to dramatically decrease the use of red light and siren for both response and uh, transport in their, in their organizations. And then these, uh, these experts will work together uh, to basically create a change package, a uh, package of actions that you can take in your system to uh, you know, deal with uh, the dispatch related issues, uh, deal with the community related issues, dealing with the uh, uh, emotions and psychology of uh, frontline medics involved in this, uh, in this kind of change. And then we'll uh, enroll uh, 30 to 50 uh, EMS systems to participate in this collaborative. And this is where uh, uh, definitely one of the things we'll want your help with is, is um, uh, enrolling uh, systems to, to help uh, do the work and basically try out the change package in their own organization. Um, we will use an online uh, system to collect uh, all the data and share everybody's learning in the process, all of the uh, things they bump up against. It's kind of an all-teach, all-learn uh, methodology and approach. Um, we'll, we'll use the, the model for improvement and small cycle uh, tests of change using PDSA cycles. Um, and uh, teach, the, uh, teach the enrollees and participants how to do it. Uh, they'll go off and spend uh, six months or so uh, testing the changes using uh, PDSA cycles and uh, sharing the learning uh, across the country. Uh, we'll come back together, update the change package based on what we've learned, go back out, try it again. <coughs> um, and then uh, uh, at the end, we will uh, uh, implement uh, the, the changes and uh, produce a, a recommended final change package that we will encourage EMS systems um, all across the, the US and perhaps Canada uh, to implement. So from, uh, that's kind of the, the, the nickel, nickel overview from that perspective. From the, uh, the association and advisory perspective, where we really need help with um, reviewing our, uh, our work, our change package as we go along, we'll, uh, we'll share it with all of our uh, association and advisee partners first, um, get your feedback on it before we, we actually roll it out and implement it. Um, we'll need your help recruiting and enrolling participants, uh, sharing the results and learning as we, uh, as we move along. And then uh, finally, um, promoting uh, the change package um, so that EMS systems all across the country uh, implement it and uh, get, the, get the reduction in, uh, in injuries, deaths, and crashes um, associated with the use of red light and siren um, in their own communities. So that's uh, that's the nickel overview, Michael. Anything I missed? No, that's a, that's great, Mike. And I and I just uh, yeah, I would just emphasize that again. We this is a teach and learn uh, all around uh, for all of us. So I think that uh, what's important to realize is that we know we don't have a, a monopoly on on the best information, and so. You know, again, the, the, the work that you, you all do every day will help us to kind of inform um, change, not, not only at the local level, but uh, at the national level. So uh, we appreciate your, your thoughts about this and uh, attention to this project.
I've put the link to register in the chat. Um, so if you haven't received that flyer yet, you can follow that link to register. Are there any questions? I just have a quick question and I may have missed it. Um, are you looking for, this is Anne from Arizona. Are you looking for like a variety of size and urbanicity as far as different agencies or mostly metropolitan ones because of the traffic concentration? Uh, we, we are uh, we are hoping to get a broad range of participants. Um, uh, certainly, uh, certainly um, one of the one of the reasons we chose Red Light and Siren as the uh, as the first kind of project to work on on a nationwide basis from performance improvement perspective is that it really touches all EMS systems. So um, definitely rural, wilderness, urban. Um, we, we need we need all different kinds of flavors and varieties in order to be able to test the ideas. That's great, because honestly, we've had the most, um, most of our rural agencies are the ones who are most adverse to change. They're the ones who, who think that they need to have their lights and sirens on to go over mountain passes and, and that sort. Yeah, Mike and Michael, this is Clay. Great presentation. You guys, I would love to have you back as this as this moves along, I, 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 kind of updating this group. Um, um, you mentioned some, um, uh, perhaps some folks could help kind of early in the process. Are you looking, um, this call is mostly filled with uh, software developers and, and the software that's used within, within EMS and then, and then EMS uh, state data managers. Um, uh, this is a great venue for both of those folks. Are you looking for both types of representation on uh, uh, during the early steps of this project? Go ahead, so, so yeah, so I we are looking for a broad um, uh, a broad range of perspectives uh, in the advisory uh, committee, and we're we're really looking for yeah. I mean, I think that the purpose of coming here was to kind of find the the technical folks who understand kind of the interrelationship between the data and the clinical care. Um, but um, we are interested in, in um, you know, it, it having folks from around, from all different perspectives to, to advise on, um, on what we're doing and the projects that, we're, that we've got. And it, it looks like uh, Doug Butler asked a, ask a question. Uh, any thoughts on how to address the data quality issues surrounding the documentation of, of lights and siren uh, usage? And, uh, and whenever you start in a performance improvement project, um, data and data quality becomes a topic early on. Um, and so yeah, every, every system has got you know, a, a, a different way to look at it, whether it's uh, being uh, captured in their CAD system, uh, their electronic medical record system, and kind of how it's looked at and um, how it's used. So you kind of, you always have to kind of begin by you know, taking a look and seeing what do you have right now and then going from there to close the gap between what you've got and what you'd like to have from a quality perspective. Yeah, Mike, that's a, uh, um, and this might be a great discussion for this group too, from NEMSIS. Uh, so we did a lot of research internally here at MHN with a lot of our state partners and even using the NEMSIS cubes, we find that about 38 to 41% of all incidents actually have this documented. Um, so less than half of the EMS incidents actually are using the additional response modes um, we found that a lot of people are repurposing the um, the urgency fields. And so I think that's maybe a huge education campaign is to get to come consistency um, on that as well. Good point, Doug. Yeah, Mike, this is Clay. Um, um, yeah, the NEMSIS TAC had a, had a meeting with, uh, with Doug and Amy trying to talk about this topic. He brings up a really, really good point. There is, there is I think, an issue with the, with the use of NEMSIS data and how it's being used, that would be really important for your group to understand. So that might be a that might be a really good place to start in regards to how how the technical side of this could really could really help us ensure that the um, a, a collection of this data is is robust. That that sounds great. And uh, just just the one thing from having done a lot of improvement science work at all different kinds of uh, healthcare is nobody has good data to start with. And, um, uh, and, you know, the, the reality is, you know, we, if you've got 38% that are documented, let's, we'll start with that 38% and, 
and build our graphs and charts and and get started with our work. We don't want to um, be paralyzed to uh, to wait for good data before we begin making changes and improvements. Sounds like we're complete. One more question in chat, it looks like, from Jeff Perkins. I see that. Is the uh, question only use lights and siren or not use lights? Uh, will there be any study on whether it's behavior related to light use, but not the lights themselves, such as high speeds? Um, Jeff, can you unmute? I'm not sure I understand your question. Mike, I, I would interpret that, Jeff, please feel free to unmute, but I think what you're, what you're asking is, is it, not the, is it not the lights and sirens that make a difference, but the speed at which ambulances travel? Um, you know, again, a lot of these things are hard to tease out, but I think that, but that there's evidence that shows that actual, that, you know, when lights and sirens are used, there's an increased danger. And so a problem, you know, what, as I understand it, it not only has to do with the speed, but it also has to do with the way in which people drive um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the changes in, the, in, in what happens uh, to traffic around uh, an ambulance that's in lights and sirens. So um, we should, you know, it's, a, it's worth a discussion and probably a deep literature review, but, you know, we've, we've decided to focus on lights and sirens uh, because we know that the evidence is there and uh, it's something that we can, you know, again, we could tease out the details, but but this is something that that has strong evidence for it. Okay, I'm, that answers the question, but I will go ahead and clarify. I did mean, you know, you know, um, having driven plenty of rescue squads, it does seem like when the lights and sirens go on, it somehow magnetizes cars into you versus not going. But I also know that high speeds can be an issue, inadequate failure to stop at stop signs can be an issue. And these are all behaviors that are related to lights and siren, although not the lights and siren itself. So that was my question and you did answer it. I just want to clarify that you did answer. Thank you, Jeff. And Peter, uh, Peter said, uh, my predecessor here in Oregon uh, worked on a hybrid lights and siren measure, uh, finding there was a high degree of association between lights and siren use and emergent calls in the data. Um, we'll we'll definitely want to unpack a little more about what you uh, what you found there, Peter. I think we're done, Julian. I think so. Thanks, you guys. We really appreciate you sharing this work with us. And like Clay said, we'd love to have you back. Be back anytime you ask. Excellent. Agreed. Thank you so much. Um, and as states or vendors have additional questions or um, feedback, please feel free to forward those on to anyone here at the TAC, and we'll make sure that um, Mike and Michael get that information as well so that, so that that's being shared along the way. Clay is next on our agenda with the State Performance Measures Dashboard. Yeah, great. Thank you, Julianne. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Great to see so many folks on the call today. Um, um, we've got a lot of important topics to cover. We've, we've talked about this several times and it's good that Michael and Mike are on the call, right? This is the, this is the next rendition of, of, of Nemesis's attempt to uh, continue to socialize and make more usable um, at the state level and at the individual provider level, the NEMSQA measures, right? How, how can we as agencies and actually individual providers be uh, looking at our clinical performance? Um, so this is the latest dashboard. We've talked about this a little bit as it was in development. It's now on the website live on the Nemesis website for states to use. And so I wanted to just highlight its, its use just one more time for the, uh, uh, for the EMS uh, state data managers that are on the call. And then of course, also for the, uh, for the software developers who we hope are utilizing the API where they can actually uh, calculate uh, state and national performance metrics for each of the NEMSQA measures. So I'm just going to go over this real briefly. Again, it's just on the NEMSIS website. And of course, it's just under state reports. It's the first listed dashboard right now because it was it, it's the most latest one that's been released. Um, it looks a lot like the public dashboard that's available for individual agencies to go in and define what their agency is like in regards to where do we, where do we serve um, 
as an EMS agency? What's the urbanicity of our, of our patient catchment area? And just uh, some organizational types, how many calls you have, level of care you offer, so you can, you can track as an agency with that public dashboard uh, your performance compared to state level performance for like agencies. And then also nationally, you can look once you define your agency with each of these measures uh, with that public dashboard, you can see how you do as an agency compared to like agencies across the country. Well, this dashboard for the state level is just a little bit different, right? It, it provides a way for the state to identify real success stories or maybe agencies that are struggling a little bit that may find value either in, um, in rewarding their providers or maybe further educating their providers about their performance in the NEMSQA measures. So the changes um, are slight. Um, we made the, the changes as slight as possible. So if you as a state send a report to an agency, they can go to the NEMSIS website and build the exact same report, right? And, and actually track it over time if they want to do that because the data, as the data comes in to the national registry, we provide it out, right? So it, it provides a real time kind of checking as you're, as you're moving forward. So uh, just briefly, I'll go over a couple of, of examples here and how it might work. Um, there's a total of almost 66 million EMS activations in this dashboard that it pulls from based on which NEMSQA measure you choose. There's about 12,000 agencies in here across the country. So each state will, will find a good, um, all of their agencies that are reporting at the national level, their data will be here. Then you can choose a NEMSQA measure that's been defined and, and we is, is able to be uh, calculated based on national data. Those are listed here. Some of them you'll find lots of calls for across the country, right? So I'm, I'm currently on um, uh, trauma dash one, which is a pain assessment for injured patients as a, as a metrics. And you can see there's 6.7 million of those across the country and about 10,000 agencies where that can be looked at. All the data was present to provide a metric. Now, um, you as a state, if you go in as a state with your state user ID and password, you'll see much fewer. You'll see those that are available for your state. And, and even at the national level, right, depending on which one you choose, there may be fewer uh, measures to look at. So let's, let's take a look at what that might look like. So I'm, I'm going to go back to just pain assessment. Oh, and then also you'll, um, as we we're just talking about, there's there's a way here, of course, to track lights and sirens use response to scene and transport as um, uh, through time. So this might be something good for Mike and Michael to be able to uh, share with agencies. They could track it this way as well. But um, let's start with this as an example. So if I, if we choose uh, pain assessment by injured patients, if you come in as a state, you'd only see the agencies within your state. I've I've kind of gone in at the national level. So I've got 12,000 agencies here. I'm just gonna choose this one called number one. And how this dashboard differs is now, you as a state goes in for your agency that you, their state ID is number one. I'm not sure which state this is from, but, um, and then you'll see this report where it provides the agency performance, the state level performance for the number of injured patients um, who receive a pain assessment, and then the national performance, right? So you'll, you'll be able to see how you do as a state compared to the nation, and the agency would be able to track how they're doing over time. So this agency just has data for 2020 and 2021. This dashboard covers from 2019 to current uh, 2021. Uh, so there would be three years of data if the agency has been consistently reporting. So again, we know this is an agency in the Northeast. They serve a suburban uh, population. They're, they're volunteer and non-volunteer. They're a private non-hospital. They see this number of patients per year in their BLS, right? So this, once, once you build this report, so say you identify some agencies who call you and want to kind of know how they're doing, or you want to highlight some real successes or provide some education, what you can do is once you've chosen your agency, you have this report done. So this, this is the single agency. There's 317 uh, activations for injured patients are included in this assessment. If you go down here, 
and you can download this in several formats. Let's, let's choose PDF and let's choose portrait. Uh, let me just, this should generate here, okay. Then um, you have a PDF that provides an overview of this, of this dashboard for that specific agency, agency number one. And, they, and, and you could email this to that, to that agency and highlight their, their success or, or um, uh, um, ask that there uh, kind of be some education done in regards to this topic. But this, this is a great way for you to um, kind of advertise and socialize the idea that there are these performance measures and you can go on the NEMSIS website or if you have a vendor that's utilizing the NEMSQA measures, uh, uh, incentivize them to look at that within their own software packages and kind of track that over time. And they can, they can always go in and kind of see what's going on in the latest uh, data that we have for that agency. And, 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 and then I'll just point out, of course, that if, if an agency just doesn't have enough measures, so say for this agency one, let's look to see if they have many um, respiratory assessments. No, they don't, right? So they, have, they, have not, um, uh, they probably have none here. So I'll take a look as to why we're getting, in, why we're getting a, a failed message like that, but it should, it should just probably come up blank. Let's choose another agency. Oh, well, okay, I'm gonna, we'll check on that to make sure that that's working correctly. But um, if, something, if something doesn't provide a lot of opportunity for you to look at, then it, it will just be scattered, right? You just, you just won't have enough data. Here's a good example of, a, of an agency uh, with only three activations. And so it just becomes very hard to be able to track that. So um, 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 this will be good to trend data for an agency over time. This probably isn't the best tool to kind of see how did I do yesterday on that pediatric call? Um, uh, but it will be a good way, I think, um, uh, uh, to be able to track over, over time. So, um, oh, oh, and, the other, and, and then the other thing I'll just draw your attention to, um, also where you find this, this dashboard, there's, there's a user manual, right? So the first question you may face as a state is, well, how, what, um, um, how do you measure whether or not we're, um, um, we're assessing pain and trauma patients. So you can go into this document. It provides an overview of how you look at and read the, um, uh, the dashboard, but you can also click here to determine exactly how each of the performance measures were calculated, right? So if you have any questions about how in NEMSIS you assess whether or not there's a, there's a pain score for a possible injury, this will describe how that's done. And we've We've checked and validated all this with Michael, um, uh, with NEMSQA. So they're, um, they've approved our use of these, of these elements in this way to um, show these dashboards. So I'll stop there and just see if there's any questions about the use of this new dashboard. All right, all right, Julianne, I'll turn it back over to you. States, feel free to use this. If you have any questions about it, use or it isn't working correctly, like I, I, I don't know whether that error message is coming up because there's so few calls or whether there's some other issue, we'll jump on that right away. But I think, I think this will be a valuable tool for you to help your agencies to begin to develop this idea of looking at a national performance type approach with benchmarks. Thanks, Julianne. Thanks, Clay. And actually, you're not off the hook. You have the next topic for oh. the introducing the HIE contractors. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Well, that's well, that's good. You can be done with me quickly. Um, 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 so, as folks know, we're working very hard to have the new version of Nemesis 3.5 and really uh, 3.4 continue to grow in its ability to share data with other other aspects of health information exchange, right? Hospitals, HIEs, and other things within states. So um, we've talked about this a little bit. I just wanna let you know that we've formalized all of our contracts with these folks. We've had an active e-outcomes work group that's been very helpful. We need to meet again, but we've kind of held off on that as we're trying to get ready for the annual meeting. Uh, uh, but just wanted to introduce the team to you. I think you've met many of these players and uh, they'll be involved in these implementation calls as we move forward. This is an active process. 
there'll be, for example, many connectathons where we would love to have EM, uh, EMS software very active in those connectathons, working with Cerner and Epic that will be there to ensure that the types of exchanges are working well. Um, just real briefly, let me quickly go over the activities uh, uh, that Eric has approved from the Office of EMS for us to complete this calendar year and the beginning, the first half basically of 2022. Um, we have completed this one where we have renewed the current HL7 CDA that uh, documents the implementation of a process to move data from the back of an ambulance into an emergency department as just a high level use case. Um, that was ANSI approved five years ago, has to be reviewed every five years. We just balloted that and it just passed balloting. So that CDA has been renewed for five years. We're also gonna develop the exact same document, but uh, update it for version 3.5. So, uh, so folks who've utilized uh, that CDA in the past to develop your implementations can look for a new version of that that's been ANSI approved out uh, with NEMSIS version 3.5. Hey Clay, it looks yeah. like you might be sharing your screen, but we don't see it. Oh, 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 interesting. Okay, okay, I apologize. Let me, let me try sharing again to see if I can get that to show. Is that- There you go, is that, yeah. Okay, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. For some reason, it, it fell off, so I apologize for that. Yeah, so um, uh, here's the renewed ANSI approved uh, CDA for 3.4. Um, uh, Jay Lyle, who's been working with us for a number of years, actually developed his first CDA. He's now working on a revision of that CDA to support version 3.5 of NEMSIS. We, we anticipate that will be validated in January of 2022. Um, um, then folks have met Andrea. Andrea is with IHE and she's developed two profiles that, that will be very helpful to us. One is the exact same use case, uh, the PCS, that is moving data from the back of an ambulance to an emergency department, but it will be written in both HL7 CDA and in HL7 FIRE, which is the, which is the standard moving forward that's been approved by ONC. It's not the IHE approach is not as detailed in regards to flushing out all the mapping as, as uh, the other, uh, the CDA approach that we've, we've published. Um, the strength of IHE and their profiles is that they, they are very active in connectathons and in making sure that it, it can be uh, uh, kind of implemented where, where HL7 isn't, isn't as strong as kind of the, the connectathon models and making sure that that's working well. So we want to take real advantage of the IHE opportunities for connectathons. And actually, Josh is going to help us to <clears throat> flush out some of some of the mappings between fire and and uh, and the NEMSIS XSD um, uh, 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 tabled values, right? To make sure that there's good there's good mapping there. So, and then finally, I'll just mention this E outcomes group, right? So Andrea has developed what's called the core profile within IHE that really talks about the movement of hospital data back into an EMS record. That could come from an HIE or it could come directly from a hospital EHR. However, that data flows back, this eOutcomes uh, group is working on a template that moves the, the version 3.5 uh, eOutcome section uh, data from a hospital patient record or, or an HIE patient record back into the EMS record so that they can look at the outcomes of patients that they deliver to individual hospitals. So, that E outcomes group is active in that process. The next, the next step in that E outcomes group is to look at what elements are going to be used to make that match between the EMS record and the hospital record, either at the HIE level or directly at the hospital. So, they're active there. We've we've asked um, uh, Dr. Greg Mears, who had a little bit of his FTE open. Uh, uh, to lead this group, and he has he's been very excited about doing that. So he'll he'll be helping with the e outcomes uh, work group, and will be working directly with Josh, Jay, and Andrea in regards to their di uh, their different roles in the development of these five products that are listed here. So that's that's an overview of kind of where we're going, and I'll just 
I'll just ask quickly if there are any questions about that process or are there <clears throat> um, deliverables in regards to health information exchange that are not listed here that we should think about. Okay, all right. I am, Julianne, I think, I think we've, we've covered my topics. All right, sounds good. Thank you. The next topic on the list is an ET3 update with our ET3, ET3 friends. I believe we've got um, John Beckett on the line and Brenda Staff in. While, while John and Brenda are, are um, gearing up, there is one question, Clay, in the chat on fire. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. So Chad, I, I'm not sure what the capability statements label. Um, could, um, um, could you unmute and describe that a little bit? That, that might be helpful. Sure, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, yeah, thank you, Chad. So the, the fire has a, um, a feature as part of the infrastructure um, that allows a fire server to report on the, the capabilities of that fire server. And they typically call that a, uh, within the HL7 fire standard, that's a, a capability statement. So basically you can, uh, you know, a, a developer can query that source uh, and find out exactly what's available. And, and usually it's done in conjunction with the profiles that, that kind of allow uh, you to know exactly what uh, resources are available and, and what's available on that particular fire server. Great, great, great comment. I did not know that. So that's that's actually very helpful. And I'll make sure that um, um, we make a note of that. And that goes back to to Andrea, Josh, and to and to Dr. Mears. Yeah, thank you, Chad. That's that's helpful. I think that would be that would be a valuable a valuable addition to the development. Thank you. All right. I think we'll, yep, John, I think we'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Um, all right, thanks everyone uh, for giving us some time to give updates. I'm gonna just run through a few technical uh, updates and then I'll turn it over to Brenda to give us uh, some final updates. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our uh, activities, operational activities, we're, we're ticking up pretty, pretty well at a good rate. Right now we're above 7 million uh, EPCRs that we've uh, been able to capture. Uh, the bulk of these, as you can see with the numbers, are historical PCRs. Uh, so we're, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty much over the hump in terms of uh, getting a lot of the participants in. Uh, we still have some challenges. So uh, in terms of uh, remaining participants who have yet to onboard, it's right around 17. Uh, we're gonna have some meetings later this week that will address how we can uh, get those participants in the door. Uh, some of the issues that they may be having could be technical, and in some ways it could be on uh, the side of just simply uh, logistics issues that they're having. So <clears throat> we're gonna work uh, with them to see if we can help uh, in getting them onboarded. Um, we've got about 134 plus active submitters. So this is on a regular basis. Um, and as folks know, it's really, uh, required that at the end of the month is when you want to send in your PCR records. So whether you do it on a daily basis or you store them up until the end of the month, um, we are, you know, we are providing you with uh, a month time frame, if you will, to get it to get those PCRs in. Uh, we have about 50 though that are inactive, and that's a concern in the sense that some of these are part of the 17 that haven't onboarded, but a lot of these have already onboarded, but we're just not getting data yet. So we're going to be working in the next week or so uh, with a couple of the, the larger vendors uh, who are assigned to those uh, participants, as well as uh, directly with the participants to see if we can get their data flowing in as, uh, as we've, uh, you know, as we've expected. Um, in terms of some of the data issues we're seeing, so yeah, in terms of the D agency, uh, D agency 01 and 02 values, we still are seeing some incorrect values coming in. 
so we're going to be working with the vendors one on one with those issues to get them corrected. Uh, what that does on our side is it does uh, require that we drop those records. And what that means is that we've received them, but we're not going to uh, reflect them in our um, in our data store. That is our system of record. <clears throat> we do need to make sure we get those in uh, so we can have a full accounting of the of the EPCR records. We also noticed a slight decrease in the number of submissions over the last couple of months. And this is something we're just going to do some research and just see uh, why those decreases occurred. Uh, some of it is because we, we were uh, looking to get uh, our, our first requirement in, which is to have the first quarter uh, EPCR records uh, submitted. Uh, but it looks like there may be a few vendors uh, or participants that have stopped sending after that. So we just need to you know, go ahead and uh, talk to some of those folks and make sure that the continuation of those submissions are, are occurring. We also have the uh, older version of NEMSIS uh, that um, might be uh, the format that the historical records are in. So whether it's version two or version 3.3.4, you know, they must be migrated to 3.4. And so again, this is an issue that uh, in some cases can be handled uh, with the vendor helping to migrate migrate those records. And in some cases, it may be something where the effort is just too much and the results may uh, require too much uh, you know, confirmation as well. So going from version two is gonna be probably difficult if not impossible, but the 3.3.4, we've seen some, uh, some success there. So just wanna make sure you understand that. Um, the last two issues here are really directly with the submissions that we're seeing. So in one case, is, in one case we're seeing multiple EPCR records um, that are being sent as multiples sent in with duplicate records. And that is something that, uh, again, we end up having to, uh, to address. And in some cases, those records, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe counted twice in the, in the database that we're using to receive uh, data exchange, uh, uh, data exchange records. So that's an issue. The other issue is we're seeing PCRs that are submitted with custom results, um, sections that contain duplicate information. So uh, this is found typically with the ET3 disposition uh, fields where we may see two instances of the same uh, you know, e-disposition field that's being represented in e-customs results. So that's something, again, we're gonna talk to the TAC about and we're gonna also reach out to those, in, those, those vendors that may be submitting with those, those issues. So these are all things we're gonna work on over the next month or two to clean up. And uh, we're gonna hopefully you know, be in a better place uh, come this fall. I just want to point out real quickly, we are preparing for Nemesis 3.5. So the timeline is the fall and we are setting up a testing environment so that uh, any of the vendors who uh, are looking to do some testing in 3.5 uh, for their ET3 submissions will be available sometime late August. So there'll be some announcement on that as well. Um, development teams, you can uh, find some of the 3.5 updates that'll be on the Nemesis site. Uh, so we're going to use that as our one of our primary uh, sources of information. And then last thing here, I just want to encourage uh, uh, not only the vendors, but maybe have them encourage the participants to register in the for the ET3 application. So that's different than the the data exchange applications, which we call CDX. Um, and when they register, they need to uh, register with the participant role. And that will provide them the ability to do monitoring as well as data management. Um, so that monitoring is very important. Uh, sometimes we get emails from participants saying, hey, did you get our submissions for this month? Uh, they can actually go in using that role and see for themselves. Uh, and then we have a, a pretty uh, good uh, data reporting environment that we're looking to stand up uh, sometime later this year that'll give you information about uh, you know, your submissions and more to come on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause there and Brenda, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, John. Hello everybody, my name is Brenda Staffan and I'm a senior advisor on the ET3 model team and work with Don Beckett and other colleagues uh, on the ET3 model. I will provide just a couple of updates. Um, we are approaching 
an important milestone for all ET3 participants as they will um, be launching their interventions no later than January 1st of 2022. So the um, model uh, uh, facilitated a ramp up period due to the public health emergency and that ramp up, ramp up period for implementation will, will uh, conclude by the end of the calendar year. So we're looking forward to all TT, looking forward to the uh, time when all, T3, all ET3 uh, participants uh, have been implemented. Secondarily, um, the CMS issued a notice of funding opportunity for the third ET3 intervention, and that is the medical triage line. So those applications have been received and are being reviewed or going through the review process, and those awards will be announced uh, in the fall. And really the third thing is we wanted to express our deep appreciation for the work that is being done um, by and for ET3 participants during this data submission and onboarding period. I know many individuals on the phone today, on the call today, have participated in, the, in that process, and we want to say thank you, um, not only for the work to date, but the continued engagement, because there certainly is more work to do. And uh, certainly, we want to always say thank you to the NEMSIS TAC, Dr. Clay Mann and his team, and the NHTSA Office of EMS, uh, Eric Cheney, and the other uh, Office of EMS individuals that uh, have been participating with us. So. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity for us to provide an update. And uh, Julianne, I'll turn it back to you and we'd be happy to take questions. Excellent, thank you. There are a couple of comments in the chat. Um, Caitlin Hanka has uh, for the 334 to 340 transform published by the TAC could help um, with, since ET3, is there a concern about the um, 334 334 to 340 loss of data that occurs in e disposition 19. I don't know if you want to address that or if that's just more of a um, good information resource that's available. Yeah, yeah Julian, this. Go ahead, Clay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, John. I um um that's a good uh, that's a good comment. I'd have to quickly look that up. Josh, have you? Um, I know we considered this carefully. I, I'm just not, um, um, we may need to get back on this issue. I think I, I, I think we've covered the e-disposition 19 adequately. Yeah, on our meetings with uh, ET3 staff in the past, we have talked about the option of um, uh, allowing senders to translate the data from 334 to 340 or the option for the ET3 uh, service to uh, translate after receiving it. So uh, I, I'd have to go back through my notes to see what decisions we made, but it has been discussed. Yeah, maybe we can address the second question from um, as well. That's a great one in regards to seeing large files coming in in custom fields. Are you seeing that, John? Have you have you been able to look closely and see whether that's been a problem? Yeah, I haven't had anything uh, reported on that. Uh, but I will take that back and just uh, um, address it with the development team. But we have, I haven't seen anything reported on that. Again, the question from Charles uh, with the, uh, with Florida, uh, John, I don't, I don't think you have, you have uh, provided any, any input regarding when you'd like everybody to be to three, three, four. Are you just following the, uh, the nemesis timeline for the, movement of, of three, three, four, three, three, four. Yeah, we're, we're um, strictly 3.4. So it, it really is a requirement that you send us 3.4 version uh, through our API. So we are not expecting any three, anything below that, any 3.4 uh, data. Uh, so uh, at, at some point later this year, we'll, we'll be supporting two versions, 3.4 and 3.5, but that'll be the extent of the support. Yeah, thank you, John. That clarified yep. that. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for John and Brenda? All right, Josh, 
You are up with future updates to the Cube for 3.5. Okay, thanks. Get my screen sharing on here. Okay, I um, wanted to give you all a heads up about some planned changes for the V3 Cube. These changes have not been made yet. Uh, they'll probably be made a few months from now. So this is just early notice of some things that will change in the Cube. Um, so. As you recall, this is the V3 cube that Nemesis provides that allows uh, the public to have an ad hoc query capability on all of the Nemesis data. For example, here I'm looking at uh, <clears throat> the count of calls broken down by the incident patient disposition. Uh, there's a reason I chose this particular one, uh, and it's because this data element goes away in Nemesis 3.5. And so in Nemesis 3.5, we have to make changes to the cube uh, to support that. Uh, otherwise, the Nemesis 3.5 uh, records would all show up as not recorded for this particular data element, which would not be particularly helpful. So um, the, let me show you what we're looking uh, and proposing changing. Um, we, we looked at the options uh, for these, these big changes, like disposition, of course, is the biggest one. Uh, where one element in 3.4 gets replaced by four national elements in 3.5, as well as an optional element. Um, and so our options here were, were as follows. We could take the 3.5 data and translate it down to 3.4 values to get incident patient disposition. And then people could continue to use the cube uh, with no modifications. Uh, but then we lose out on all the new value that 3.5 brings with those new elements and we lose a lot of um, detail. Uh, another option was to um, just support incident patient disposition for the 334 and 340 records, and then support the four new elements for the 350 records. And, uh, and then as I noted, if it was a 35 record, uh, it would not show up in incident patient disposition. It'd just be a bunch of not recordeds there. And uh, conversely, if a record was in uh, 3.4 format, then there'd be no, re no value in it for these new uh, 3.5 data elements. So that would make analysis pretty tricky too, because someone would have to do essentially two different analyses and then try to pull them all together. Uh, Another option was to translate both ways. So um, to keep incident patient disposition and then to add the four new elements and then to use the Nemesis translation resources to fill in both directions from 3.4 to 3.5, 3.5 to 3.4. And the final option, um, which we are proposing to go with is to remove incident patient disposition from the cube and to up translate 3.4 data to the four new elements in 3.5. Uh, the goal here being that we would um, have the latest, uh, we would be supporting the latest version of the standard as kind of our core, and that version 3.4 data would have the data translated into these four new elements. So someone doing analysis uh, would be able to not worry too much about whether the data under the hood was 3.4 or 3.5 they're gonna get the unit disposition for all those calls. They're gonna get the transport disposition for all those calls. So the effect here again will be that, that this uh, dimension in the cube will go away. It won't exist anymore. And in its place, we'll have four new dimensions available for analysis. Um, so where does this uh, affect things? There are some data elements um, that we plan to remove from the V3 cube. Uh, I've listed those here. These are elements that uh, um, were either retired or will no longer be national elements in version 3.5. So we plan to just remove these ones from the cube so that we don't have people running into uh, questions about why they're seeing so many not values, um, so many blanks in these elements over time as, as Nemesis 3.5 becomes the predominant version. And then I've listed the elements where we intend to do translations. So primary role of the unit uh, will get translated uh, from 3.4 to the 3.5 version of that element, which has uh, been relabeled to unit transport and equipment capabilities. 
level of care of this unit was retired and in 3.5 level of care provided per protocol was added. We plan to do a translation on that one. It's not a precise translation, but um, can be helpful. And then of course, the example I showed, incident patient disposition, uh, translating into the four new elements in 3.5. We wanted to give you all just a heads up about this change um, because what it means is if, if someone has been using the cube and using incident patient disposition as one of the dimensions they're looking at in their analysis, which is quite common, probably one of the most common uh, dimensions that is used in the cube today. And maybe they've saved that query and uh, they bring it up every once in a while to get some new data. They're gonna have to redesign their query. They're gonna have to figure out instead of using incident patient disposition, which of these four new elements do I use or which combination of elements do I use um, to break the data down the way I wanted to see it. So it does mean that, that people would have to um, uh, redesign their query as this change is made. Uh, as I said, this is a few months away from uh, actually being implemented. So this is an early heads up and we wanted to do that so that we can give you all an opportunity to provide feedback. Um, let us know if this change is gonna be too uh, onerous, uh, that it's gonna be too disruptive to uh, the way that you've used the cube, uh, or if you have other thoughts, you know, dis kind of disagree with the uh, direction that we're proposing here, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that uh, so that we can uh, potentially adjust our direction if we need to. And then uh, the change itself will probably happen around the end of this year. So probably, uh, you know, about six months away or so. Okay, and um, so I'll stop for questions. I see uh, Anne put something in the chat for incident patient disposition specifically. If there was a translation from 3.4 to 3.5, would there be a way for us to filter out uh, certain 3.4 dispositions? For example, if Nemesis added agency assist, unit assist, and public assist as a certain part of the new dispositions, could we remove or uncheck, for example, public assist from the translation when we run a report in the cube? Yeah, um, the, the cube natively supports the ability to filter out specific values. Um, and so I don't know if I can come up with it. Eh, I won't come up with it quickly here, but, um, but essentially you can, you can make this, you can put this in the filters section and then you can decide um, which of the specific values you want uh, to keep. Uh, here we go. Um, so you could decide, you know, which ones do I want to look at and exclude some others. Gosh, this is Anne, but I meant if you go with the option of no longer displaying the E disposition 12 in the updated cube when the 3.5 data is in there so that it's kind of all one um, category, mm -hmm. whatever your translation is, would we be able to kind of break down and uncheck certain ones. I don't even know how that would look. I don't know. It's just, I just know like some of the dispositions in e-disposition.12, we find agencies don't use them at all like we, like they're defined or like we thought they would. And so we just like to take them out because they end up making the data really look messy. Like it just doesn't mean what everyone thinks it means. So yeah. um, I just wondered if we could kind of customly almost like break down and kind of take out ones that we wouldn't want to have in there. I don't know what that would look like exactly. I just know I wouldn't want public yeah. assist. I pretty much take public assist out a lot because it doesn't get used properly a lot of times when I look at it. Right. Uh, the translation would be performed as the data comes into the cube. Um, I'd have to look at the translation documentation to remember what these three values get translated to for each of those uh, four different elements. And those would be the, the ones that you would want to exclude. Um, and uh, we're gonna try to make sure that we also add Nemesis version as a dimension in the cube. So you could, um, you know, you could identify, okay, here's all our data was, that was 3.4 versus our data that was 3.5 if you're needing to get into a little more fine-grained detail um, on these translated dimensions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I forgot to mention, we're also gonna add some new stuff to the cube. Um, I didn't cover that today because uh, that doesn't really affect existing uses that people may have. Okay, any other questions?
All right, thanks. Oh, let's see, one more. Uh, once the translation of e-disposition is completed, can you share the translation document? Because the translations are not straightforward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me show you that real quick right now. Um, go to the technical resources menu and then go to translation, mapping slash translation. And uh, there they are right there. So here's the three, four, uh, three, four to three, five translation. Bring that one up real quick and you'll see just how complex it is as we go down to um, uh, let's see, where's our disposition? Here we are. Uh, okay, so there's our agency is, assists, you know, for, for edisposition.27, they become no patient contact. For edisposition.28, they become not applicable, et cetera. So, and, and some of these translations get um, a little uh, sticky in places, but yep, it's all documented there. Okay, uh, Julianne. All right, any other questions for Josh? Thank you, Josh. That has been a lot of work. We appreciate that. Next on the agenda, Monet is going to visit with us for a few minutes about some um, fixes to State Dataset Builder. Okay. Okay, Julianne, can you see my screen? I sure can. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for being on the call today. I am basically going to um, talk about a fix, a technical fix that um, was applied for the state data set builder, but I wanna cover a few um, questions that have uh, come up in emails. So first of all, um, on the homepage of the NEMSIS website, when you scroll down to the state map, um, typically you can look at your information here. I'm just gonna use Georgia as an example. And so you would click on your state data set and um, this allows you the opportunity to view the document. Um, I want you to see the title here. It says uh, state data set and, and simply that's it. Now, if we go back to the home page of the website, in order to modify your state data set, you would need to go to the view reports tab and then go to the state data set builder here. You would click on the first link and that would take you um, to the state data set um, information. Um, let me just go ahead and click on okay. This takes a little while to load, but what you'll notice here in the title is that it says builder. And this is the page that you need to be on in order to modify your information. Okay, so I'm gonna exit this page and I am going to go to um, the Georgia tab. Uh, let me, okay. So let me move some of this stuff around here. So one of the things that, um, that typically happens on this page. I actually have um, one of the updates that are typically made on the state data set um, are agencies or the facilities. And so I actually had the uh, Georgia page up. Let me see if I still have it. Uh, okay, it's here. So let's just say for instance, I want to add a new agency. So I'm gonna call this agency Cassie Longhart's uh, EMS agency, and I'm gonna add the agency number. So this first column represents the unique agency ID, which is D agency 01. John Beckett uh, talked a little bit about this in his ET3 presentation. In this state, you can see that D agency 01 and D agency two are assigned the same number. So now what I want to do is I've added my new agency and I want to save this document so that I can send it to the TAC to post on the website. However, we get this box that says there is a problem and you need to fix it. 
it's telling us specifically where that problem is, is located. And it's saying it's in the custom data elements. Now, this also might say that it is located in the facilities section. But for this particular issue that we need to fix, we're going to go ahead and click on the custom data elements uh, page to look at those um, eras. This first agency, or sorry, this first custom um, element information, um, it, there is a red box here, and this is, um, is indicating that this particular um, custom element has an issue that we need to address. So I'm gonna click inside the box so that it opens here. And what we're asked to do now is to fix the data type. Um, if we click on the box below, we can see that there are several options for the type of uh, the data type. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the data type, we would simply go to the data dictionary and we would look at D configuration for that particular element um, name and then just simply click there. And you can see here in the attribute section, the data type is identified as a string. So now that I know that that's what needs to be fixed, I'm simply going to go and select that it is a string. You'll see that the red box is now removed and I can save the document. But it's saying, okay, well, no, you can't save it because there's still a problem. So I'm simply going to say, okay, I know it's still on this page somewhere. So although we fix all of the custom elements, we can continue to look at the other elements. And now I see that eExam08 has a similar issue. So I'm gonna go ahead and click there. I know that it needs to be a string. The reoccurrence, uh, let's say yes. And the usage type, um, this particular element, let's just double check eExam08. We're gonna go back to the data dictionary. Okay, so the usage type is optional. Let me go back to the builder and then I'm just gonna click optional. Now I should be able to save this particular document. Um, and once I save it, I can then send it to the tag. But I'm gonna do one additional thing just because I know that um, although uh, Cassie would love to have an uh, EMS agency, this is not a true agency. So I'm just gonna remove that agency. And now I'm gonna try and save the document. And it says, yes, I can successfully save this document. I'm simply gonna download this document. It'll create that XML document. And this is the document that I can now send to the TAC for posting on the website. There's one additional thing I wanted to talk about on the view reports tab, we have um, a section here that's called state reports. And there is a report called state V3 state assets. Currently, I can see that 51 states have um, a state data set builder, have at least started a state data set. And so um, this information is really helpful because you can now identify not only the states um, in one place, but but the last date that the state data set was updated. The reason I wanted to bring this up is because I've encouraged state managers to start working on the state data sets. Um, as part of the V35 standard, this state data set will become a mandatory part of compliance testing, which means that the software vendors will need to update this information for the states. But I believe just my opinion that as you have become familiar with the state data set and you've identified your agencies and your facilities and what elements are required in your state, this will actually help that process. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm going to thank Georgia for allowing me to use their state as an example. And then I just wanna ask if there are any questions. Okay, I know that went really fast and I apologize. We do send out updates for the state data sets um, each week on Mondays. So if you have any questions or if you need any assistance updating your state data set, don't hesitate to give me a call. My information is on the NEMSIS website. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to you, Julianne.
Thank you, Monet. Appreciate you sharing that with us. I know that there have been several states who have had questions about that. So thanks for, thanks for the update. Uh, for the next topic, we have invited Caitlin Hanka to demonstrate how AngelTrack is implementing a data forensic measure. So we're going to turn over some time to Caitlin Hanka with AngelTrack. Howdy. Thank you for that. Let me see if I can get my screen up here. Okay. <laughs> yes, we see your introductory blather. Yeah, I'm going to blather for a minute before I show you. Um, we have been thinking about a problem that was created by the very success of the NIMSIS project, and that is NIMSIS data is all over the place with more and more people downloading it from AngelTrack for billing or statistical purposes. Because so many people are using this data, sooner or later, some of it is going to go astray. And when it turns up on the black market, and then comes to the attention of a forensic investigator, that investigator is gonna look in the data file and he's going to find enough information to blame AngelTrack and enough information to blame the provider that it came from, but there isn't enough there to actually decide which employee originated this uh, or when it happened. And so he is gonna be stuck not knowing not knowing how to go forward with this investigation. And so we have implemented an extension to the PCR custom data fields. Uh, can y'all still hear me? Am I coming through? Yes. Yeah, okay. yes. Yeah, okay, we're thank you. All right. Um, so here is our proposal for an extension. Um, these are two custom fields that are added to every single PCR that we emit. Um, these are the field definitions. They're just two strings. And this is what the data would actually look like in a NIMSIS file. So here, the first field, IT record.100, shows who and when and where. Uh, this is the case of if a biller were to download just some, some NIMSIS PCRs. And here is the case of uh, if we upload the data to a state trauma registry, this is how we mark it. This is us marking the data to say who we sent it to and when. And the second field, IT record.101, is just a base 64 encoding of the first information. So that if a somewhat clever evil person was to go and delete this one, he may not think to delete this one too. And, and so any forensic investigator could take this information right there and paste it into a base 64 decoding website online and retrieve that. Um, so, uh, and here is a helper function. If anybody is thinking that this would be a good idea to implement, this is what you would need in SQL to quickly perform the conversion of this plain text information into this base 64 information. I thought this might be helpful because I had to go and research this myself. So screenshot this if you think you might want to implement it. Um, and so here is what I see as the advantages and disadvantages of this. Oh, and before I go any further, uh, AngelTrack LLC hereby places this document into the public domain because we think that this would be a win-win-win for everybody in this in our ecosystem. Um, we think that every PCR vendor could benefit from this because this allows you to pass liability as you are passing data. So when you give data off to somebody, you're also handing over par at least partial liability for that information. So this is a win for any PCR vendor. And it's a win for any data forensics investigation that happens down the road. So, um, we, uh, this is now public domain, so anybody who wants to implement it, um, you are welcome to. Um, one of the advantages of this is that this will pass through, this can pass through a, uh, any kind of intermediate system. So because it's, because the information is in what everybody, uh, what the system thinks are PCR custom fields, then it's going to get preserved. And it can pass through a NIMSIS version transform too, or any kind of transform. Um, now, when an intermediate system receives it, if they are aware of these fields, 
then if that intermediate system, like, like a, a billing system that is importing data pulled out of a PCR, if that billing system then has the option to re-export its data, well, then they can simply update these watermarks and say, yeah, I, I gave it to somebody new. It's don't look, don't look at me if this goes astray. This is who I gave it to, and this is when I gave it to them. Um, and in my assessment, this is very simple and easy to implement. Anybody could do it. Um, and probably no one would ever notice that that information is in there. It's not obvious. It's buried way down in the custom results near the bottom of the file. No one's ever going to see it until such time as it's necessary. A um, couple of disadvantages. Um, somebody who is very sophisticated could, could find it and figure out what it means. Um, and then if there is an intermediate system, like if AngelTrack passes data to an outside billing app, and then that outside billing app passes the data onward without re-watermarking it, well, then that data is still going to show that it, was, it originated in AngelTrack and was sent to that outside billing app from whence it, it would be presumed to go astray. So anybody who it re is receiving NIMS's data and then passing it onward again in a re-export would benefit, would get the same benefits if they simply update the watermarks. Um, and an open question in my mind is whether or not we need both. Uh, the reason that I implemented this as two fields, one as plain text and one encoded, is that I wanted to possibly help a forensic investigator who doesn't know enough about the world of EMS to go and look for this field. Because there's going to be people who really aren't part of our ecosystem but are called in to investigate a breach. They're not going to know what this means. Even if they were staring right at it, they're not going to know what it is. So for the benefit of that guy, I want to put it in as plain text. But of course, putting in as plain text could possibly tip off somebody that this data is watermarked. So not sure what the right answer is there. Presently, we are doing both. But anybody who implements this could maybe consider that choice on their own. So that's all. What do you guys think? There's a couple of comments in chat, Caitlin. Okay. Let me see if I can find those. Okay, that is a great idea. A, a cryptographic signature. Um, we about the hash. That, yeah, we could put a cryptographic signature on this, independent from this. Uh, the problem with the hash on the document, though, is that it would break um, when this passes through an intermediate system. Um, unless the intermediate system is exactly preserving the XML rather than regenerating it, a uh, hash would not survive. I did think about that, though. Maybe you could add an IT record.102 field. You could add another extension that just says, here's a hash of the whole thing. We could put that in a third field. Okay, anyone else? Okay, well, it looks like- I was like just gonna mention oh. a little bit about the name of the elements. The IT are usually custom elements that have been implemented by image trends for the IT. I wasn't sure if uh, these had come from them or um, might, have, might have been some confusion about the name. Oh, okay. I picked IT because I see that as the name of a lot of state custom elements. Would it be more appropriate to call it e-record.100? Yeah, I, I recommend you know. somebody do something a little more uh, direct about what it is. Um, but the IT prefix usually means that image trend created the custom element, which is you know, most custom elements from states come through them. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, I can. And that's why you're seeing the IT, but the, um, yeah, so the comments well taken, but um, um, the approach is really, is really awesome. Okay. So if the consensus is that we rename it to e-record, then I will make that change. And uh, I'll get this document to you, Dr. Mann. Um, I, I offer it to you for inclusion in the National Custom data set. Um, we, we have already implemented it, but I'll go ahead and make that change to e-record. 
And anybody else who sees a benefit in it is welcome to implement it as well. Great. Great. In Arizona. I have a quick question when you mentioned changing it to e-record and maybe I shouldn't have been doing this all along, but I usually look and anything that has an E in front of it, um, a D and now an S, I assume those are in the NEMSIS standard in the sense that they are available through all vendors. So if you put an E in front of it, um, maybe I'm just not using it right, but I don't know if there's another one to kind of indicate. This isn't necessarily something that I can know for sure that every single vendor will have available, which I can kind of count on for anything that's in the NEMSIS, that a dictionary standard that isn't a custom element. Yeah, yeah, that's a good comment, and it looks like Frank Frank agrees. What um, what do folks can uh, think uh, Caitlin can do to to make these uh, feel unique? Um, this is Josh. Josh. Yeah, um, <laughs> the national custom elements have several elements that start with an E. They all have a three-digit sequence instead of a two-digit sequence after the dot. Um, so, for example, we have ehistory.901 for recent travel. Um, so, yeah, we've already gone down that road with the national custom elements. Um, so, the, the flag being that it's a three-digit sequence instead of a two-digit. And, and Caitlin has gone with a three-digit sequence there. But, yeah, it's all uh, the custom element IDs or whatever someone wants them to be. Uh, there's no constraints on those. So okay, technically so, speaking, anything is valid. Okay, so is there any objection to naming them like this? I don't. I don't think so. Um, Josh, can you can you see an issue with that? Nope. Yeah, like I say, it's really whatever you want it to be. Yeah. But as David said, IT is usually stuff that Image Trend created, and so if you use IT, there's a chance you could. Use, you could use an identifier that Image Trend had already used in their systems and have a conflict that way. But uh, and and then of course you could have conflicts this way. Maybe there's some other software product that already created an eRecord.900. So I guess it would just be up to the software vendors to to let each other know if that's the case. Yeah, if there's anyone on this call who is using eRecord.900. Um... Well, okay, uh, about that comment right there from Mr. Fisher, I don't want to name it. I, I didn't want to name it uh, after Angel Track, while at the same time suggesting that everybody would benefit from using this. If it, it, I, I was hoping that this could become part of the NIMS's custom library for everyone to benefit from, because I, I don't. I, I, it seems to me like a win-win-win, and I didn't want to name it after myself for that reason. And Caitlin, this is Josh. Another thought that came up as you were describing sort of the chain of, of the record going through multiple custodians mm -hmm. um, is that perhaps uh, it, you know, one idea is to make the recurrence yes, and each um, custodian in that chain of custody could add their instance. Oh, with, that is without so removing the previous instances. Clever. Yeah, that's that's gorgeous. All right, so let it be written. <laughs> and on a larger note, I, from a personal perspective, I've thought for years that the NEMSIS standard structure needs to have a little more uh, spots for metadata in it. Things like this, things like when the original record was created out in the field, um, uh, when it was last modified, uh, you know that kind of stuff. And and so that's something for everyone to think about for a future version of Nemesis, uh, as to you know maybe it's time to get a little more metadata into the standard. Well, that is above my pay grade. Um, I couldn't agree more though, uh, but it's got to be, it's got to have the same advantage that this approach does, which is that it has to survive a transform. And so 
anybody who processes this data and then regenerates an XML and passes it on, it's got to survive that process. Which means that if it doesn't, header information maybe probably gets stripped off in that case. Yeah, yeah, this is clear. Those are really worthy comments. Thank you. I think that's I think that's incredibly valuable. Um, and Kaylin, thank you for your generosity here and your willingness to share. I think I think this is great. We'll have to we'll have to think here how best to make this available, right? We we I don't know that we would want to publish something like this in uh, using our normal channels. So we'll have to we'll have to also kind of figure out. Um, um, how we can distribute this and make this available to others. But thank you, Caitlin, for the um, push in this direction. Oh, sure. Thank you. Caitlin, there is one more um, suggestion from Adam um, at Zoll. So that's in the chat as well. I, I apologize. We are out of time. Um, I think we'll table the last two items on the agenda for the next call, uh, but I do want to give Eric a minute. If there's anything you wanted to add, Eric, before we close out the call. No, ma'am, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you to our guest presenters today. We really appreciate you being willing to um, share that information with this audience. Um, our next V3 implementation call will be July 28th. Please watch your Google group notifications for reminders on registering for annual meeting, which is August 3, 4, and 5. So that's just a few weeks away. Um, a detailed agenda is on the way or is um, being finalized and will be on the way to you soon. Um, we did send flyers and topics that, that will be included. Please let us know if there are any questions um, or if you need further information. Thank you everyone for being with us today. We appreciate your time. Have a good day. Thank you.